Thank you so much, Will. It is, um, it is a point of privilege, I guess, I get to take today because it's not often that I get to do... <laughs> get to do worship with my family. <laughs> I'm just a crybaby this morning, I guess. So. Yeah. Um, my son and his wife and my grandson... Uh, they live in St. Louis, and, you know, what about me? What about my needs? You know, that it would be nice to have them closer, but what an opportunity we haven't gotten to do and lead in church uh, for several years now. So what a privilege. Thank you, Pastor Josh, um, that I get to do that. Um, I do love your pastor and pray for him often. Uh, you know, he and I definitely are kindred spirits, and I'm very glad the Lord put us together for such a time as this. I, I get the opportunity to work with 70 churches from Dawsonville to Johns Creek, Woodstock to Jasper. And so about 70 you know, churches that we partner with, but there's about 1.2 million people in that box. And so for one church or one small group of churches, that would be difficult. But for the 70 churches that we partner with and about 300 total evangelical churches of all kinds, there's a lot of people in North Atlanta who need to know about Jesus and live for Him, and we get the uh, opportunity to do more together than we can separate. So I appreciate your church being a part of that partnership and appreciate what we get to do together. Hopefully you have a Bible with you this morning, and I'd love for you to open up to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I would really like to preach the whole five chapters, but I only have so much time, and the way it usually goes for me is I have about 12 hours worth of speaking to put in 30-ish minutes, right? 20. Uh, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. If you wouldn't mind, let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. We don't worship the book, but we give honor to whom it is from. We thank God for His inerrant, infallible, inspired Word. Everything we need for life and godliness is contained between Genesis and maps, because I think concordance sort of goes in there too, so works out well. And reading from verse 1, and I'll read down through verse 9, it says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Verse 3, blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this even though now, for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. So that proven character of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, through, though perishable, is refined by the fire, and it may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though not seeing Him now, you believe in Him, you, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Would you pray with me? Father God, you are so faithful and true, and we are grateful that you lean down from uh, timeless eternity into the present and even in our past, and you provided a way for a relationship with you. God, thank you. And as we are reminded on the Lord's Day every week of the resurrection uh, God, we need your strength and we need your hope today. In a, in a crazy world, we need you. So, Father, uh, be present in this room today. By the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to us and encourage us. And, Father, this morning I pray that you allow me to take a step back and allow Christ and the cross to be seen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated if you can. I always like throwing that in there, just be a little Bapticostal, but... I don't think anybody will run the aisles or anything this morning. Um, you know, looking at our world, our world's a little upside down. I, I, I have to be very careful not to, to listen to talk radio, 
all the time and, and, and watch the news all the time be, because I can get fixated, I can soak in it, I can, I can you know, meditate on the fact that our world is crazy, that if you look geopolitically anywhere from the Far East with China uh, on through what's taking place in Russia and Europe, Central and South America, we could be a little concerned. We could be. Uh, if you look, uh, as some people look mystically to the skies, and we see a, a great thing in the heavens taking place tomorrow, people of ancient civilizations would say this is an omen and a sign, and people all over the world are looking at it like something crazy is going to happen. You know, probably not, but it's in there in the back of most people's mind. Our world is crazy and upside down. You know, I, I don't know if you know this, there's an election coming up. And I don't know, whichever way it goes, it, it could be upside down and a little bit crazy for a whole bunch of reasons. And, and I know I'm starting off as a little ray of sunshine this morning, I can tell. Um, but here's the thing, our world is upside down and, and we, really, we really need a place of hope, right? We really, need, we really need a place because if we were to fixate and we were to concentrate on all that kind of stuff, we could get bogged down in analysis paralysis and we could be so discouraged about life and tomorrow and everything else that we, we couldn't function today. Some people are paralyzed because of their past, because of things that have happened to them, circumstances, stuff, and whatever else. Some people are paralyzed by the future in anxiety because they're worried about what's taking place. But we as God's people, we have the Scriptures and God gives us reasons not to pay attention to that stuff. So just as the people that, that Peter, to whom he is writing, in his day, those people needed encouragement, and we need encouragement. Uh, the Apostle Peter was writing to a group of people, and, and we see it, and it's a whole bunch of names that, that you may not remember or may not even be able to pronounce. He says, to those chosen living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, right? There should be a little map of that. Um, if you look at the map, and maybe you'll be able to see it on the, on the map there on the screen, all these places are in northern um, what would be Turkey today, right? It would be probably about from here to northern Kentucky, right? And what some scholars look at this passage and, and see what happened, that they say that it, it's as if Peter is writing to some of the people that were there when the Holy Spirit came down in Acts chapter 2, because you see some of the similar places named whether it's Cappadocia, Pontus, Galatia, Bithynia, it, it's possible that some of the people who were there when the Holy Spirit started the church, that those people after Acts chapter 6 and, 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 and going on to, through Acts chapter 13, those people dispersed and scattered and went all over the place, and many of them may have ended up about as far as here to northern Kentucky. I wouldn't go into Illinois because that's like a different country, right? But almost, right? That was... That's for you, Josh, there. But, but the people traveled, and so Peter, in the same way that Paul wrote to give encouragement to some of the people who were dispersed and scattered, and if you see in the verse, first couple of verses of the, the, the little letter from James, James is writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Peter's writing to the people who were in the northern Turkey, close to the Black Sea, all that kind of area. He's writing to them. Now, think of these people. These people have been displaced. Maybe they started off in those areas, went to Jerusalem and came back, or maybe they were originally in Jerusalem. Either way, people were displaced, so they had to move. Um, and that part of, of Asia Minor was under Roman control, but there was constant political strife. That area of the world, even today, you hear of great earthquakes and all kinds of stuff taking place in Turkey. Just in the past couple of years, some of the earthquakes in Turkey that have been so devastating, many people losing their lives. And so these people displaced from what's familiar to them with political strife and turmoil, things going on in the world and, and in the heavens, and they just need something solid to stand on, right? They, they, they just need, they don't want to be tossed around anymore. And Peter, writing an encouragement to them, gives these words. He first says that according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now think about it. This did not catch God off guard. God was not worried. Oh no, what's going to happen to those people? Like, he, like God hadn't read the next chapter. 
God is omniscient, omnipresent. He's everywhere of all time. He stands outside of time and space. He sees it all at once. It didn't catch God off guard. In fact, in the book of Acts, um, Peter talking to the Areopagus said that people were put in their locations for times and places so they might, if possible, be able to reach out to God. God in his sovereignty was not caught off guard by these people being displaced so far from home or us in our culture and context with the craziness of the world. Think of it. COVID did not catch God off guard. People are so depressed because of anger facing backward, or they're so turned upside down because of anger and fear facing forward. And our world has come to a standstill. America has at least. And God it, it didn't just sneak up on him. In his sovereignty, he knew where you would be. He knew what would be going on. And there's a, a sense of confidence that I can trust his hand to place me where I need to be. The second part, he says, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. The people to whom Paul, uh, Peter is writing in this letter, he's writing to people who've put their faith and trust and hope in God. That we know from many of Paul's letters have been sealed by the Holy Spirit until the, until the day of redemption, the day of promise. Once you put your faith, trust, and hope in, in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. You are baptized by the Holy Spirit into salvation, redemption. You're adopted into a new family. And the, the, the sanctifying work of the Spirit, both sanctifying you and, and God seeing you perfect, but sanctifying you daily, the, the Holy Spirit's with you. And the third part, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Christ, your sins are forgiven. You're not bound by your past. And so if, if Peter's trying to set up, this, the, set up the stage to say, folks, listen, you are in, a, in the place exactly where God wants you. He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. Your past has been paid for. Your future has been secured. You ought to trust him. What an environment for him to be able to say the rest of this stuff. And then he says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. That was a common greeting for letters back in the ancient world. But I really think that the apostles really added theological significance to every phrase. So it goes to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of His great mercy, we see that in the, in the Scriptures, He's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, last week, what, what was last week? It, it wasn't just the day the bunny comes, okay? It, it, was, it was the resurrection of Jesus. We celebrated the risen Jesus, right? And, and probably your pastor, like so many pastors across the country, talked about what that means and, and the significance of it. I was in a church, uh, my sister-in-law's church in North Carolina a couple weeks ago. And on the Sunday that we were there, a guy named Lee Strobel spoke. And I don't know if any of you know Lee Strobel. You probably may have met him personally. Uh, Lee Strobel was a writer uh, in Chicago on, on the, for a, a legal writer. And he was confronted with, with the stuff about Jesus. And he went out to prove that, that Jesus really didn't raise from the dead and all the stuff around him. And he ended up proving to himself and to many other people that Jesus is who he said he was. He believed in the resurrection, the case for Christ, the case for the Creator. Several books that Lee Strobel has written uh, would exercise that journey, right? Strobel last week summarized all of the proof for the resurrection, that, that this was a real, literal, historical event. It's not some mystical, mystical thing. It's not some possibility of, of some fable that somebody came up with. This is a literal, historical event and, and Strobel said there are four things that, that prove that, right? The first one is the word effective. The Romans were effective killers. The guys who, who put him to death had put many people to death. When they, when they said somebody was dead, they, they dead, right? They're not coming back. If somebody was on a cross and, and came off and sort of lived, that guy would probably lose his job. Okay, or his head, either one, right? The, the Romans were serious about death. They took it very seriously. They put people on spectacle on crosses. And when, when the guy took the spear and thrust it into Jesus' side, and he had been dead long enough for the blood to separate from the platelets, the serum and, and blood and water flowed, the guy knew Jesus was dead. He, he didn't just come up in the grave, oh, I've been, I've been you know, in this cool, calm you know, grave, and I've been revived, right? no. Jesus was dead, and the Romans were very effective at killing people. Second thing, early. 
The word early is a very interesting thing because it was not some fable made up years later. It was the day of the resurrection. The followers of Jesus started talking about how Jesus had been raised from the dead. It started off with the women. And my wife and I have had this conversation. That they probably wouldn't have learned a lot more about what happened at the resurrection if it weren't for the women there because what they do? They ask questions, right? All God's women said, amen, right? Because what happened when, when Peter and John get there? John writes in his gospel that he was in better shape and he ran faster and got there before Peter, right? But he's a little scared, so he doesn't go in. Peter goes in. He sees Jesus had been very kind to fold up his stuff and put it at the end of where he was laying. I guess that's a lesson for some of us. Um, Jesus wasn't there. He was risen. And instead of asking anybody any questions, Peter and John just left. But what did Mary do? Where have you taken him? What have you done with it? This is just a, I don't know. I, you may not be enjoying that as much as I am, but I think it's pretty funny. The women were the ones who found out. They were saying, Jesus isn't here. He's risen. And the men came along later. And then they all started so early in the conversation that Jesus is alive. And, and it's not just early like the, the day of, but it's early in, in reference to historical things. This legend of Jesus, quote unquote, didn't happen 30, 50, 100, 1,000 years afterwards. There are some people who come along and say, well, these myths about Jesus being the Son of God and raising from the dead, that was myth and legend that was made up much later. No, we have evidence and historical evidence, even the, the book of 1 Corinthians, written within 20 years uh, of the resurrection. Paul himself says, hey, you know, I'm writing, these things happen, and there's some people who were alive who saw it, you could even go ask them. So we have historical record, even with written record, even within 20 years, not 50, 100, 1,000, whatever. So they were effective. The Romans were. Number two, it was early. Number three, the tomb was empty. Even Jesus' enemies said the tomb was empty. The Jews were like, hey, you know, it, it, if, if something happens or if something happened, they paid off the Roman guards saying, if somebody asked, just say his guys, you know, knocked you out. Really? You got buff, you know, Roman soldiers. I used to be buff. This is as best I got right now, all right? Buff, you know, what time is it kind of thing. They're standing there. They're, they, they would be put to death if anything happened, if somebody could break a Roman seal. And so these guys, special forces guys, standing there guarding the nine feet around them. And if anything came in it, they were to put it to death. And you would think that some followers of Jesus who were scared, hiding in their mama's house, we're going to come and overpower the Roman guards, slide over a three-ton rock, pull Jesus out, and say, look, he's risen? No. The tomb is empty. And the Jews acknowledged it. The Romans acknowledged it. And even Roman historians look back to the common phrases that were taking place there that his disciples said that he was risen from the grave. The tomb is empty. In fact, if you were to go over to, to Jerusalem today, you would find what... what tradition has. There's a couple different places. Either way, they're not saying, look, there's the body of Jesus. They're saying he's not here. The fourth one, E, is eyewitnesses. You know, the, the women at the tomb, the disciples, and the disciples in the upper room who actually got to touch him, the over 500 people at once who saw him, and that could be a reference to Jesus when he was going back up to heaven. But let me say this, a summary to say this, and your pastor probably preached it last week, Jesus is alive. The real historical event of the resurrection took place, and it's the reason we have hope. It's the reason. But the, the second part of that I think is just as powerful, not just the, the part about Jesus, you know, the resurrection is real, but some of the so what after it. The, some of the so what after it that I talk about is first that there is, the resurrection is proof of Jesus' acceptance and his identity. And let me, let me tell you about that. It's proof that God accepted the sacrifice that Jesus gave. Jesus gave a substitution. He took our place. Uh, atonement. He satisfied the wrath of God against sin of all time. And Jesus took the punishment of all that. And when Jesus was stretched out between heaven and earth, he gave his life for you and me. He gave it as a sacrifice. That's what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper. We celebrate his suffering. We celebrate his sacrifice. So when Jesus did that and he says, tetelestai, it is finished, he, he was giving up his life as a payment for sin. Well, what proof is there that that, that, that 
payment was accepted. Well, we see the proof in the, in the acceptance that Jesus was resurrected by the power of God from the dead. That Jesus, and not only did it, did it prove the acceptance of his sacrifice, but it also authenticated his identity. Because Jesus over and over said, you tear down this, this temple in three days I'll raise it up. When, you know, I, I'll be put to death and rise from the dead. Jesus said over and over to his disciples and others that he would die and be raised. And Jesus died and was raised. Jesus was not just a good teacher. He was not just you know, a good guy teaching happy things, you know, dressed like a, a dope-smoking hippie from California, right? And we'll th- that's a good line. I'm just trying to make sure you guys are awake, okay? Jesus stood there proclaiming to the crowds these great and wonderful things, and he also told them that he was the Son of God. And the resurrection affirms that. It helps prove that Jesus was who he said he was, and it helps prove that his sacrifice was accepted. The second thing is, it's a promise of deliverance and hope. We see in in Romans chapter 6, before we go back to 1 Peter, some of you are wondering, is he going back to Peter? I am. Hold your finger there. In Romans chapter 6, it says, uh, beginning in verse 1, shall we say then, should we continue in sin that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin live in it? Or you are unaware that those of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him in baptism into death in order that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, so too we may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly be in the likeness of his resurrection. That there is a, a confirmation, right? There's, there is um, a promise that in the same way Jesus was resurrected, he's the first fruits, he's the first one, that we will be resurrected. That is the promise that, that he will raise us from the dead. And we see in 1 Corinthians 15, the, the last section of that, talking very powerfully about that. The focus of what I want to talk to, to continue with today and the, the focus of this passage is not only the proof of his acceptance on identity, not only the promise of deliverance in the future, but power for daily living. That the, the power of the resurrection that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you and me, right? It's available to us. Looking at 1 Peter, it says this, we've been, we've been uh, verse 3, he has given us a new birth into a living hope and through the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that's imperishable and moving unfading. God has given you the same power of the resurrection that you can overcome sin, that you can overcome problems, that you can live the life he calls you to live. In fact, still holding your finger here at 1 Peter, go into Romans chapter 8. Paul giving a great defense of what's taken place. Romans chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 1. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I'm really glad about that. Because the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. Uh, going down to verse uh, 4. In order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those of us who live according to the flesh have their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on the things of the spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death. The mindset of the spirit is life and peace. Verse 7. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it's unable to do so. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit if indeed God lives in you. If anyone does not have the spirit, he doesn't belong to him. Verse 10. Now if Christ is in you, the body of death, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. This is not just the idea of resurrection someday, but it's also the power of the Holy Spirit living within us today. I I don't know about you, but I need that. Here's a crazy thing. Most of what takes place in the church in America today could go on and on and on if the Holy Spirit didn't exist. What a sad thing that we can do most, many churches can do most of what they do without the power and the presence of Almighty God. I've been thinking about that in my own life lately. Do I I contemplate, do I think about, am am I shaken by having the presence of God in my life? 
oh, I need that. I need his power and his presence because I can try to be a good person. I can do occasionally good things, but I don't want my righteousness. I want his. I don't want good things that just come from me. I want to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus. I want him to live in me so that I have power to do what I don't normally, not able to do. So when Peter's writing to these folks, he's saying that's the kind of stuff that comes from the resurrection. This, this promise of a future, this proof of Jesus who he said he was, and the power to actually live it out. Because he says here in, um, in that same verse 3, the power through the hope of the resurrection rising Jesus Christ from the dead. That lives in you. You have access to that. This is how he describes it. Uh, this power that you have, uh, he says down, he says, verse 6, For you rejoice in this, even though now for a short time you suffer grief and various trials, so that, the proven, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which is perishable, is refined by the fire. You have the opportunity to say, okay, God, I need your presence. I need your power. I need your help. Have any of you gone through a difficulty in the last year, three years, five years? Something so difficult you thought it was going to wipe you out? I don't know if I would have made it without the presence of God. I don't know if I would have made it without God's power in my life. And, and Him working through me and, and, and walking in me. Because I would, I would have quit. In fact, there have been times in, in my life that I just wanted to quit and give up and die. <clears throat> and maybe that's been you too. But Peter's saying here, you don't have to quit. You don't have to give up. You don't have to say, I can't go on. Because this difficulty that you're going through is an opportunity for God's power to be manifest in your life and for you to change your perspective on what's going on in you that you can continue and grow and push through to the other side of difficulty. Um, Let's go on down to verse 13, okay? Because I'm going to run out of time and I have 12 more chapters to cover. Partially kidding. To give you assurance so far, the resurrection is real. God's power is available in your life. And he says here that you've been given an inheritance that can't be stolen, can't be taken, won't go away. It's being, as the Word says there, being guarded by God until it's revealed in the last days. Based on those things, people who are going through difficulty, Peter says the same thing to those people then that he says to us now. He gives us three things and says, you know what, based on those things, I want you guys to do three things. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to exercise hopeful anticipation. Verse 13 says, therefore, with your minds ready for action and being sober-minded, set your hope completely on the grace that's brought to you at the revealing or the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, Peter uses three different or four different commands in here. The whole section above is he's describing the reality of stuff. But starting in verse 13, he's looking right at you and me, and he's saying, this is what I want you to do. The first thing, I want you to have hopeful anticipation. What does that mean? It means put your mind in the right place. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says that we're supposed to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. We're supposed to, to camp out there. Philippians chapter 4 says that we're to think on whatsoever things are good, lovely, true, praiseworthy, anything of good report, meditate, soak in these things. But too often, even us as as followers of Jesus, we listen to the enemy who whispers into us, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good, baby, you're no good. Right? You could write a song about that. Some of us older people know that there's a song. I'll keep going. But you know what? We listen to the voice of the enemy. And because we have not changed our stinking thinking, we continue to act and behave and do just like we used to. In Ephesians, Colossians, <coughs> and even in Galatians, Peter or Paul writes that we are to take off this old man, take off this old way of thinking, and put on a new way of thinking. Peter says it four times in this book that we should be sober-minded. What does that even mean? that we should be able to take a deep breath and then think about right things. He says it in chapter 2. He says in chapter 4, verse 7, and chapter 5, verse 8. He emphasizes four times with these people, get your mind in the right place. 
Be, be sober in your thinking. Be, be measured in your thinking. Right? In the military, they train some folks to do this. It's, it's called the OODA. It's the Observe, uh, uh, Orient, Decide, and Act. OODA. And I think about it all the time, even with reference to this kind of stuff. Observe. See what's going on. Orient yourself. Figure out you know, what you have, what the circumstances have. Make a decision on what you're going to do, and then act on it. OODA. I think that's the kind of thing that we're supposed to be doing as followers of Jesus. That we're supposed to observe the times. Things are cray-cray. Things are a little outside. It, it, it's nuts. But I can't be concerned <coughs> with all the things that are nuts. I have to be measured. I have to slow down. And I have to put on the mind of Christ because He gives me the things the way I ought to think and then the way I ought to act. If I orient myself to the fact that He is who He said He is, if I orient myself to the fact that He has paid for my sin, my past is paid for, my future is secured, if I orient myself to the fact <coughs> that I am a, His child, He fills me with the power of the Holy Spirit, and I can overcome this, it changes everything. Uh, in special forces stuff, they talk about uh, how when you hit the wall, for most people, when they hit the wall and say, I can't go on, I can't do any more, it, it, it's not a physiological thing, it's a mental thing, because most people hit the wall when they go to 30% of their capabilities. Is that you? Have you found something in your life that is just insurmountable, I can't overcome, I can't get through, I can't get to the other side. You're so trapped by feelings of depression from the past or anxiety to the future that your thinking has trapped you. God doesn't want us to stay trapped because out of our thinking comes behaviors. And He's calling us to, your mind's ready for action, being sober-minded, taking a deep breath, what is God's truth about this situation? How can I change this? How, what do I need to be reminded of? It says, set your hope. It's a powerful command. I set my hope completely on the grace brought to me at the, revel the revealing of Jesus. What does it say in Hebrews chapter 11? <coughs> it says, faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. What does that mean? It means I'm putting my faith and trust and hope in the God I cannot see for all the things that I can see. That I'm putting my hope in it. I heard a story a long time ago. Some, I've told the story so many times, some people could almost tell it with me. <coughs> but years ago, um, pre-World War II, the, the America, America was going through economic difficulties and the government made up a job for people. And one of those jobs was the Civil Conservation Corps. And what they would do is they would um, find jobs for these people to do and go do them. One of the things that they did is they would, would take valleys and fill them in with water and make hydroelectric dams. They, they did it all over. In fact, when Lake Lanier, not too far from here, is low enough, you can see some of the old houses and the old buildings down at the bottom of the lake, probably where fish live now. But sometimes those will be exposed, right? Right. Well, they did this throughout mountains and valleys and that kind of stuff in, in Tennessee and Kentucky. Well, there was a surveyor who would go place to place and, and just keep an eye on this stuff, check on, see what was going on. And this whole valley, this, this one place that he visited, had already been bought out, but the people continued to live there. And so he would go by and check, and year after year, the, the buildings and the houses they lived in were, were starting to fall apart. The little street down the, the, the main place where people lived and did their shops and stuff, was, was weeds were growing up everywhere, but the people were still there. And uh, he saw a guy sitting on his porch over on the side, this older fella, and he said, Sir, excuse me, why, why, are all, why is all this taking place? Why is it, you're still living here, but the place is falling apart. And the old man leaned forward on his chair, spit in his spittoon, and he said, son, there ain't no work in the present if there's no hope for the future. And I can't help but think mankind is wired that way. You, you read um, researchers and psychologists and counselors, and they talk about how people have to have something to live for, a purpose and a hope. Well, we as believers, we should not be the kind of people who are in despair. We should be the kind of people who have a hope to live for. That it, the hope that we have within us, 
it's so evident on us that people ask us, hey, why are you so hopeful? Why, why is this going on in your life? Well, your world's falling apart around you. How can you stand up to this? And that's where Peter says in 2 Peter that we should give people the reason for the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. That we're supposed to be the people who are the most hopeful when things are upside down. And Peter is saying to these people who've been cast out of where they used to live, he says to them, folks, Put on, put your hope completely in the grace that's coming to you. You are to exercise hopeful anticipation of what's coming. The second thing, not only because of the resurrection, because of our secure thanks. <clears throat> i got to lay off the smokes. Just kidding. Thank you very much. The second thing is not only do we have hopeful anticipation, we also need to have a heavenly action Watch what Paul, Peter says in this passage. He says, as obedient children. Don't we all like obedient children? When was the last time you went to a restaurant and the people sitting at the next table from you had disobedient children? And all God's people said, amen or oh me, right? As, I, I want to be an obedient child. But as obedient children, don't be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. That's, that word is the same word in Romans chapter 12 where it says, don't be conformed to the, the pattern of this world. The, the, the word in the original language is like a schematic. Don't follow the pattern and the stuff of this world. It says, don't be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. Verse 15, but the one who called you is holy, and you're to be holy in all your conduct. For it's written, be holy as I am holy. Verse 17, uh, we'll, we'll just do 15, 16. Um, God is holy, and it's not just uh, a holiness that we can't approach, right? It, it's, it's a holiness. He's significant other. He's without sin. We cannot approach him. And it's like, man, how can, I, how can I be like that? And the thing for us is we can't be perfect and holy without Jesus. He says to us, be holy as I am holy. What does that even mean? That means I'm supposed to live just like in the Old Testament, they had three levels of, of, of stuff. You were unclean, and you could do sacrifices and stuff, and you could be clean. But then to be, go clean, you had to do sacrifices or be set apart for a purpose, and you were considered holy. So you were either unclean, clean, or holy. And maybe you haven't done anything bad in your life lately, but are, are you holy? The holiness here is living a righteous life powered by God. But I need to be set apart for a purpose. Imagine your behaviors being different if you live up to the fact that you are set apart for a purpose. Would that change something for you? Three times in this passage, Peter says, hey, it's in all your conduct. Your conduct should be different. Your way of life, he says in verse 18, he's using the same word. And it has this idea of your pattern and your way of life. So think of this. Is your life different because you have been saved? Can people see anything different in your life versus somebody else's? And it's not that you have to be just weird. Don't we look at people sometimes who are trying to be holy and they're just weird? It's like, I don't think that's what he's talking about. You know, God didn't necessarily call us to be weird, but he called us to be holy. That the pattern of my life, the, my purpose for living, the way I do things, it doesn't just look like my neighbors. It doesn't just look like everybody else. But I'm trying the best I can through the power of the Holy Spirit to have a different way of life. So what I do on Sundays might be different. The way I spend my money might be different. The way I treat the people around me might be different. Your way of life ought to reflect somebody who's been set apart by God. Now think of this. You might think, oh, that holy people stuff, it's sort of like if we're Catholics or whatever. Oh, only certain people get halos and, you know, maybe the priest and that kind of... Paul and Peter both appeal to people and say, the holy ones of God. Did, did you realize this? When you became a Christian, he set you apart for a purpose. You are supposed to be a holy priesthood. That you've been given a new way of life that the holy thing is not just for the pastor and his family and that we have a standard for them and their kids that we don't apply to ourselves. Amen or oh me. <clears throat> it's not just a, oh, pastor wears a halo and that kind of stuff. No, every one of us ought to live a life that's set apart for a purpose. 
that when you go to the grocery store, the movies you watch on Netflix or whatever else, your life is set apart. Peter's saying, based on the, the things you've been given, be sober-minded. Set your hope completely on Christ. The second thing is that you ought to be holy. And he furthers that in verse 17. He says, if you appeal to God the Father who judges impartially, according to each one's work, and you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, your old conduct, <clears throat> inherited from your fathers, not with, imperishable, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Think of this. The blood of Christ paid for your life. And if an innocent man gave his life for you, you ought to live up to it, specifically if it's Jesus. You've been given a command for hopeful anticipation. You've been given a command for heavenly action. And the last one is a command for heartfelt affection. <clears throat> Look at verse 22. It says, since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth, so, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly. Not just on holidays, not just on birthdays, not just on weekends. Love one another constantly. Well, I, I have trouble loving people, period. I don't have the power within me. Where am I going to get that? Well, it's very simple. When you abide in him and his word abides in you, when you do the whole John chapter 15 thing, that you're able to produce fruit, one of the fruit of you abiding in Jesus and spending time in Jesus and asking him to help you with things is fruit called love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are called to abide in him and produce much fruit. I often ask the people, D are you growing in Jesus? Well, how do I know? Do you have more love this year than last year? Do you have more peace more this year than last year? Do you have more patience this year than last year? I, I can't help but look at this and go, you know what? I am desperate to, for God to produce fruit in my life. I'm desperate to, to do these things, and I can't get it together on my own. I must spend time with him and have him produce fruit in me. Bottom line is this. Who's in charge of your life? Who runs your life? Your, your affections, where you put your heart. Who runs your calendar? Who runs your checkbook? Who runs where you put your eyes and your thoughts and your meditations? Who's in charge of that? If you say that you are a follower of Jesus, he calls you to greater, higher, and better. And I really think if we get this thing that I need to put my life in his hands, I need to ask him for leadership, I need to ask him for guidance, I need to ask him for trust. I, <clears throat> me doing the stuff on myself, I'm going to end up in a ditch. But him facilitating and guiding my life and helping me to walk through it, it changes everything. I found this little quote, and, and, and I thought it was appropriate for this. It says, it depends on whose hands it's in. A basketball in my hands is worth probably about 25 bucks, <clears throat> but a basketball in LeBron, LeBron James's hands is probably worth 75 million. Depends on whose hands it is. A tennis racket in my hands is probably worth $75. That's a low one. A tennis racket in Venus Williams' hands is probably worth $50 million. Depends on whose hands it's in. A rod in my hands will keep away a wild animal, but a rod in the hands of Moses parted a mighty sea. A slingshot in my hands is a kid's toy, but a slingshot in David's hands was a mighty weapon. <clears throat> Two fish and five loaves in my hands is a couple fish sandwiches. But two fish and five loaves in the hands of Jesus fed 5,000 people. It depends on whose hands it's in. Nails in my hands can maybe produce a birdhouse, but nails in the hands of Jesus brought salvation to the world. It all depends on whose hands it's in. Your life in your own hands, <clears throat> you can end up doing some things. You maybe even have financial accomplishments. But do you accomplish everything that God has called and created you to do? I, I, I don't think so. But your life in the hands of the Master, 
the one who has bought you with a price, the one who has a, an inheritance waiting for you that's immeasurable, it, it, it can't be stolen, it can't be corrupted, that he gave his own son to die in your place, that he gives you life and hope and power and ability, that it seems to me that when I try to do the things on my own, I end up in trouble. But when I place my hand and my heart and my time and my wallet and my family and my future in the hands of Jesus, I'm blessed and the people around me are blessed. As I close out today and as Will comes up and we'll close out our service together, <clears throat> Easter is a great time. Easter is a celebration of the risen Savior. But on that Monday after that, the disciples had to live and you have to live. How do we go on? How do we do this? The only way I do it is with my faith and hope and trust only in Jesus. That I come to him daily and spend time with him and, <clears throat> and, and in his presence is fullness of joy. That I read the scriptures and I spend time praying and talking to him <clears throat> and I get the power to live out the life daily to love people who are unlovable, to do things that are impossible, to hold on through the difficulties and to achieve and overcome at the end, not because I'm anything great, but because He is. You want good things going on in your world. You may have to endure for a time, sure. <clears throat> we count it all joy when we face trials of many kinds, knowing the testing of our faith produces perseverance. We, we understand that. But man, my encouragement to you is Set your heart on Him. Be willing to change your behaviors and live out the way He wants you to. And here's the hard one. Be able to love people with a sincere heart all the time. If I'm going to do that, I need to lean into Jesus. And if you're going to do that, you need to lean into Him and the power of the resurrection who helps you do it. So would you bow your heads with me? Close your eyes. <clears throat> There's some of us today that have been looking at the circumstances of our world and they're just, you're discouraged. Set your mind on Him. Have hope. There's some of you that, that are discouraged because of what's going on in your family or walking through difficulty or whatever else. Lean in on Jesus. There's some of you sitting here that, yeah, I, I have anxiety looking towards the future or I have depression looking towards the past. How do I even get past that? By changing your thinking and leaning into Jesus. Father, I, I pray for the people here this morning. I pray, God, that you can do in us what we cannot do ourselves. Left to ourselves, it, it might not go so well. But God, as we follow you and trust you, we have hope. We have a secure future. Oh God, help us to trust you. Help us to lean into you. We thank you for not only raising Jesus from the dead, <clears throat> but giving us access to who you are and what you can do. Thank you for sending Jesus as the one, the sinless substitute for our difficulty, our pain, our, our sin, and Him paying for our stuff so that we might have life and hope and a future. God, help us to live it out and then help us to share that with other people. I thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place, and I thank you for being my living hope. I pray, Lord, that you move in the people here today and remind them of who you are and what you do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody look right up here. Will's going to lead us in a song. <clears throat> and my encouragement to you today is to observe where you are. Orient yourself to God and His truth. Make a decision to lean into Him and to spend time with Him and to trust Him. And then the last one, to act. Because we can hear platitudes, we can read books, and we can... It's all kinds of great things in our head, but the biggest gap in the world is between knowing and doing. The biggest gap in the world is between the head and the heart. 
God doesn't want you to just be filled with knowledge. He wants you to do something. And so Will's going to lead us and maybe you need to call out to God and, and ask God for forgiveness and a reminder of who he is in your life and then the power to do what he's called you to do. Would you stand with us? And will you lead us? And then Pastor Josh is coming.